Uh, I welcome you all to this uh, uh, Sanem organization at this UN wider conference. And uh, this session is on socioeconomic effects in South Asia. So the session aims at bring, uh, to bring together leading research from South Asia to discuss the effects of the pandemic on lives and livelihoods in their own countries, the policy responses and how effective have they been and how COVID-19 will transform the economy, states, and societies of the South Asian region. So I will actually introduce the panelists uh, as I you know, uh, get to them uh, for the intervention. But before that, let me uh, kind of set out the tone and as well as uh, share the experience from Bangladesh with you all. So looking at the kind of effects of the pandemic on lives and livelihood in Bangladesh, so what I would say that probably this is also applicable to many other countries that we can look at the three uh, you know, indicators, three major areas, what I call PI, P-I-E, poverty, inequality, and employment. These are the major areas where we have seen the COVID-19 had its uh, impact on the bad impact. In terms of the poverty in Bangladesh, Sanim did a lot of surveys. Actually, one survey Sanim did towards the end of last year at a very large scale uh, National Represent Household Survey, where he found that the poverty rate in Bangladesh went up by, uh, it, it was kind of doubled from its pre-COVID level. And also there is a kind of serious fallback into the poverty because there are those who are vulnerable poor, but not officially poor, they fall back into the poverty level. We also saw a huge jump in inequality and also huge disruption in the labor market, especially job losses, uh, uh, direction in uh, income and also job switches. We are also, so from Sunny, we have done quite a lot of surveys. Actually, we have done over the last one and a half years, five rounds of surveys on what we call the business confidence index. We try to look at, we are serving for more than 500 firms and try to understand how the firms, business firms, they're actually responding to this COVID situation. And we found that uh, that SMEs are especially badly hit. And I'm quite sure that in many of the South Asian countries, we also have the same kind of experiences. So what have been the policy responses and how effective they have been in Bangladesh? So immediately after the COVID, we saw that lockdown measures actually came in. We also saw a huge vulnerability of the health sector to cope up with the crisis, especially the health sector to begin with was in crisis in Bangladesh because of very low spending in the health sector, public spending. At the same time, what we observed that uh, there were serious institutional challenges in the health sector. And that continued during the COVID uh, period and that's still continuing. And uh, uh, in, with respect to having the access to the vaccine, and we saw that, you know, uh, you know not very certain it is there uh, because of over-reliance on, on one specific source and then struggling to get vaccine on time and there's global politics as well. Probably we'll hear from other panelists uh, about their own country experiences. Government came up with the stimulus packages, a uh, number of stimulus packages, and also extended social protection programs. But I would highlight that there are two major institutional challenges. First one is reaching out to the new poor. As I mentioned, that there's a jump in the poverty rate, and which actually caused that uh, uh, rise in what we call the new poor. But the uh, existing social protection programs uh, were not able to reach out to those new poor because they were not designed in that way they could reach out to the new poor. So a large number of new poor actually are still left out of any kind of government support during this crisis time. And the second institutional challenge, I think, which, which is very much related to the uh, social protect, uh, stimulus package, is reaching out to the micro, small, and medium enterprises. And we have found that repeat we have surveys by Sanem and some other organizations among others that the SMEs, though they are the worst hit during this COVID situation, they are the least recipient of the government support during this crisis. And uh, the stimulus package, the way they were designed, the way they were disbursed, were not very much helpful to actually support the micro, small, and medium enterprises. And there's a strong political economy factor as well, because those farms, those sectors who have strong lobbying power, strong voices and strong links with the political and business, elite, business elites, they were able to grab the major benefits out of the stimulus package and the support so far. 
So, so how is actually now they're looking forward at uh, how the things would really you know is going to transform, and then uh, and what do we see in the, in the in the coming days? So my point would be that uh, COVID is actually here to stay. We we can't expect that COVID will go away very soon, and uh, we are seeing one after another new variant of COVID, and so that means that that that, that the health crisis or the virus related crisis is going to stay for long, which means that we have to plan accordingly. We have to devise our development strategies, factoring in the COVID situation. And I have written, and we have our book from Sanem uh, uh, repeatedly in Bangladesh that we need to come up with some sector specific and area specific protocols uh, to cope up with the COVID situation. That means that the, uh, uh, the protocols uh, in the in, in, in urban area would not be same as the protocols in the rural area. Also, the protocols for any manufacturing firms would not be the same as the protocol for any service-oriented firm. So we need to come up with these kind of protocols. Unfortunately, over the last one and a half years, we haven't seen this kind of development in terms of developing protocols. And while we need uh, involvement of the major stakeholders, not only the government, but also private sector, uh, different other stakeholders, sector experts as well. We need to, I think this is kind of looking forward, you know, how do we really see in the future and what uh, with respect to our development strategies, we need to revisit the, our uh, what, what, uh, the sustainable development goals because by 2030, we I'm quite sure that many of the developing countries will not be able to uh, meet the SDGs, a large part of the SDGs. And then I think uh, since it's a South Asian panel, uh, you know, I'm re I'll be really glad to hear from the distinguished panelists that how this South Asian cooperation can actually help to get, you know, out of this crisis. We should look for new forms of regional cooperation in the health sector, how to address the pandemic, and also the new situation, what we are observing, the rising poverty rate, huge job losses, rising inequality, whether we can extend our cooperation in the social sector as well. With this, I'd like to conclude here uh, my intervention. And I'd like to request Dr. Ganga Tilakaratna, uh, who is the, Dr. Ganga Tilakaratna is a research fellow and he is the head of the poverty unit of Institute of Policy Studies of Sri Lanka. He is a leading think tank uh, in Sri Lanka and she has done quite a lot of work on poverty and social protection. So over to you, Dr. Ganga Tilakaratna, and look forward to hearing. Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you from different time zones. Let me uh, first of all thank you and Wider and Sanem uh, for inviting me for this session. Uh, so we all know that COVID-19 pandemic has led to massive disruptions in lives and livelihoods of people around the world. It has pushed millions of people into poverty in a way leading to a reversal in the global movement towards poverty alleviation. So as a result, many countries today have faced increasing rates of poverty and widening income inequality. And Sri Lanka is no exception. As per a recent study by the World Bank, over 500,000 people in Sri Lanka had fallen into poverty due to the pandemic, which has led to an increase in the $3.20 a day poverty rate from around 9% to almost 12% in 2020. And even the extreme poverty as shown by the $1.90 a day poverty rate, though small for Sri Lanka, uh, it's kind of less than 1%, but has almost doubled during this period. So what these actually imply is that the pandemic has caused in a way a reversal in the progress made towards poverty reduction in Sri Lanka over the past five years or so. The main contributory factors for the rise in poverty and inequality is the employment shocks caused by the pandemic particularly in the forms of job losses and fall in income earnings, etc. So basically, the pandemic has affected workers across all employment categories. However, similar to many other countries, the effect has been more severe on the informal sector workers like daily wage earners, casual workers, as well as self-employed persons who account for about 60% of the workforce in Sri Lanka. Now, adding to this, a considerable number of private sector workers to have experienced job losses and wage cuts to the pan due to the pandemic. And this is partly also a result of the large number of informal workers within the private sector in Sri Lanka in the form of contractual and casual workers. 
So recently, the studies have shown a growing informalization within the formal private sector in Sri Lanka, and which is likely to worsen now due to this crisis. The pandemic uh, also has uh, led to an increase in the unemployment rate of the country, particularly among the youth. Um, so as per the labor force survey data, the overall unemployment rate has increased only by around one percentage point during 2019 to 2020. But the unemployment rate among the youth, especially those between 15 to 24 years, has increased by around 4.5 percentage point from its already high level of 21% in 2019 to around 25.7% in 2020. So basically implying around 20% increase in the youth unemployment rate in Sri Lanka from its 2019 level. So not only the uh, unemployment and poverty, so basically the pandemic has had a significant effect on the Sri Lankan economy. The economy contracted by 3.6% in 2019 compared to 20. 2020 compared to 2019 and several sectors were also also affected particularly hotel and accommodation sector food and beverages manufacturing construction transportation sector so and so forth in particular the tourism industry that had already been affected in 2019 due to the easter sunday bomb attack in sri lanka uh, was further affected by the pandemic particularly due to the various um, travel restrictions and restrictions on uh, tourist arrivals, etc. So the government now, in order to provide relief to people and uh, businesses um, affected by the pandemic, the government has taken various measures since uh, March 2020. These uh, include uh, cash transfers and food rations to vulnerable groups and uh, various concessions and credit facilities to affected businesses, including concessionary loan schemes for SMEs, and firms uh, in selected sectors, um, say at, in apparel sector, plantation and IT sectors, and relaxed requirements on loan settlement and leasing facilities and concessions on statutory payments like income taxes, VAT and other taxes. So a long list of things. So one of the key uh, measures by the government to support the vulnerable groups was the 5,000 rupee cash grant, which was given to low income families and other vulnerable uh, groups such as the uh, senior citizens, uh, persons with disability, and especially those whose livelihoods were affected by the pandemic. During the first wave, this 5,000 grant was basically given to vulnerable groups of the entire country for two consecutive months. But from the second wave onward, it was confined to just the lockdown areas and uh, just five, one 5,000 chunk for a, for a family. So um, a rapid survey that um, uh, was that was carried out by the Institute of Policy Studies, IPS, that I'm attached to this year, revealed that over 70% of the recipients of this cash grant were actually from low-income households. And of the remaining households who were primarily from lower middle-income to middle-income groups, the majority had experienced uh, income falls during the pandemic. Now, interestingly, Doctor uh, you have a minute left. Yeah, inter I'll, I'll wrap up. So, interestingly, almost all the recipients covered in the survey have found this uh, five thousand uh, allowance was useful, or if not extremely useful, to meet their needs, especially purchasing food during that time. So, uh, uh, let me wrap up soon. So, going forward, uh, I mean, while the pandemic has posed many challenges and has caused many disturbances to uh, people's lives and the economies. It has also given us an opportunity uh, for the countries to strengthen the existing systems like the social protection system and our health system, and also to harness technology, particularly digital technologies. I mean, all of which would help build our economies in a way back better, uh, hopefully, in the long run. So thank you, and over to you, Sally. Thank you very much. Uh, definitely, we'll come back to you in the second round. And I request the participants who would like to pose any question to panelists, to all of us. So please, you will look at this Q and A uh, 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 Q and A section, and you can actually pose your question there. And uh, we'll, we'll we'll come back to those questions in the second round. Now uh, I will call to the next panelist, Dr. Fakhar Ahmed, who is the Joint Executive Director, Sustainable Development Policy Institute, SDPR Pakistan. Unfortunately, Fakhar could not join us live because of a very sudden uh, meeting uh, of him with the minister. So.
he sent a video uh, recording of his intervention. So I request Ram to play this video, please. Ram, over to you. Uh, let's just me leave for a second and I'm come back to okay, share. So I, I move to the next panelist then. Yep. Why don't you move, uh, request uh, Pushpa Sharma, uh, who is the executive director of South Asia Watch on Trade, Economics and Environment, Nepal. Pushpa, uh, please over to you. Six minutes, please. Thank you, Salim. Uh, first of all, thank you so much uh, for organizing this panel. Thanks to WIDA for having a South Asia panel here to discuss the effects of the pandemic on the lives and livelihoods, what have been the policy responses and the way forward. Uh, certainly, as uh, has been uh, said earlier, uh, things are not different uh, in Nepal as well. Uh, there has been 770,000 know, infections until yesterday, which is 2.6% of the population and 10,838 deaths until yesterday. And these are official figures. Certainly, uh, actual numbers could be much higher because many have gone uncounted. Uh, when you look at the economy, there was a contraction of 2% in the fiscal year 1920. In the last fiscal year, 2021, uh, which actually ended 15 July of this year, uh, the estimate was of 4% growth. But uh, because of the second wave, perhaps this still uh, uh, might not be the case. It might have gone uh, down. Uh, looking at the uh, poverty, which uh, uh, in the case of Bangladesh and Sri Lanka, uh, also uh, had shown that there was an increase in poverty. It's the same in Nepal as well. A report prepared by the National Planning Commission actually showed that 1.2 million additional people were pushed into poverty because of the pandemic, and which meant that uh, the poverty increased by 4% in the fiscal year 1920. Uh, and this is because, uh, you know, almost all the economic sectors have been impacted, but some of the sectors actually, they are uh, they have been impacted more than the others, like tourism, hospitality, transportation, and others. Uh, because of this impact, uh, this disproportionate impact in some of the sectors, uh, the uh, impact on employment has also been, uh, you know, uh, disproportionate. Uh, so ILO it estimated that uh, 3.7 million workers they earn their livelihoods in sectors that are deemed most at at risk uh, due to COVID-19, and out of these. Uh, about 1.9 million jobs have been disrupted because of the pandemic. And uh, a monitoring survey by World Bank also found that more than 40% of the economically active workers in Nepal uh, they reported an incidence of job loss or prolonged work absence. And as is the case in other countries, SMEs and women-owned and managed enterprises, they have also been hit very hard by the pandemic. Uh, in terms of food security, uh, WFP found through a survey that there was a 23.2% spike in food insecurity in Nepal uh, during the lockdown. And this is almost like obvious when uh, livelihoods of people were at stake. And also in terms of uh, children's education, as is the case, I think, in almost all the countries that have been impact. So the impact of the pandemic uh, on uh, the lives and livelihoods have been quite harsh. And how has the government responded to this? Uh, in terms of policy responses, certainly, in terms of the you know budget for health uh, before the pandemic, it was very meager, as in the case in other South Asian countries, as Salim also pointed out, in the case of Bangladesh. And after the pandemic, the, in, the, in the budget, the government came up with an increased budget for the health sector, also setting aside money for the purchase of vaccines. Uh, unfortunately, though, uh, vaccines couldn't be purchased on time. There were many, uh, you know, different uh, political economic reasons as well. And if we look at the uh, population that is vaccinated so far, it's just 19% of the total population. Uh, when we look at the fully po vaccinated population, 16%, this is a bit higher than many countries in South Asia, but only 3% are partly vaccinated, which is much lower than other countries in South Asia. And until vaccine is there, uh, to cover most of the adult population, uh, things are not going to improve for sure. Uh, and uh, in the initial period of the pandemic, when the lockdowns began uh, through the local governments, uh, there were some distribution of food and essentials. But because of the lack of a database in terms of who are the vulnerable and who are the needy, uh, this uh, didn't go as planned. And uh, for, uh, you know, all of the vulnerable people couldn't get access to these uh, items, to this food and other items. The government came up with a plan in terms of providing employment through the Prime Minister Employment Project through, and through other local development programs. But uh, this also couldn't go as planned. And we could see you know, queues of Nepali people heading back to India and other countries for work. 
uh, once the pandemic started subsiding after the first wave. Uh, one uh, good thing that the government did was uh, contributing to the Social Security Fund. Now, this is a fund recently set up in which 20% of the basic salary is contributed by the employer and 11% from the employee. Uh, so in order to provide that relief to the both the employer and the employee, the government contributed this whole 31% to the SSF for the period of lockdown months. But what happened was that people who were in the formal sector and uh, those who had been enrolled in the SSF could get that they could get this facility. But in the country where 85% of the employment is in the informal sector, this did not help uh, to those you know, uh, uh, workers. Uh, similarly, there were like sorry, some, minute left. Sorry, okay. yes, I will, I will, I will wrap up. And similarly, there were other, uh, uh, you know, uh, monetary measures rather than fiscal measures in terms of a reduction interest rate, and of uh, you know, the different loan and interest payment that the government provided, which was quite a relief. But as in the case of Sri Lanka and other countries, it uh, the SMEs have not been able to uh, make the most of these measures. So we, when we look at uh, uh, how to go forward, there are actually two uh, special things uh, that I would want to highlight here. One is uh, regarding the attainment of the SDGs. Nepal already had an you know uh, average annual uh, uh, financial deficit of five billion dollars to attain the SDGs, and now the pandemic has made this even worse. So as uh, uh, Salim said earlier, uh, perhaps there is a need to revisit uh, on, on in terms of how the SDGs are going to be attained. Uh, similarly, Nepal is now approach, uh, going for double graduation. Uh, one is that it has already moved from a, a low-income country to a lower middle-income country, and it's also going to graduate from the LDC in 2026. And already because there are fiscal strains uh, to the country, uh, these uh, developments are going to uh, impact uh, the country more in the days to come. So perhaps in terms of uh, uh, going with the regional cooperation, which we did not see actually happening during the pandemic, uh, there is a need to revisit uh, regional cooperation and, and also other forms of cooperation uh, in terms of, uh, 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 you know, uh, facing the impact of the pandemic. Uh, I stop here uh, and we'll be happy to take questions. Thank you, Salim. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pushpa. So let me then invite uh, Dr. Prabhid Dey. Dr. Prabhid Dey is a professor of uh, the Research and Information System for Developing Countries, RIS, and the coordinator of ASEAN India Center AIC at RIS India. So Dr. Dey, over to you, please. You have to unmute, Dr. Day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Raihan. And uh, I think there is a noise coming inside. Now it's better, yeah. And uh, my co panelists, and Sanem and uh, you and you wider uh, for the invitation to come to this panel. And uh, thank you once again for taking the lead, Dr. Raihan, uh, for organizing such an important session. Uh, in six minutes, um, uh, what India did and uh, what uh, South Asia will be doing, it's a really challenging task. But I will, I will only touch upon some of the best practices of the region and on socio-economic fronts. If you recall uh, uh, that eight countries in South Asia, including Afghanistan, uh, almost all of them have met with the second wave. And some countries now having a third wave, like Sri Lanka or uh, for the matter, Nepal for, uh, in that way. One reason why India successfully contained virus uh, uh, because of its rapid vaccination program. That's actually helped India. I, again, I said in bracket, temporarily, uh, because our festivals are coming, uh, which is a one and a half months from everywhere, and we can, we can see a different scenario maybe unfolding. So, so far, uh, over half a um, you know, half of the Indian total population official statistics indicates that is, the vaccination has been completed. And uh, so this is the best practices that I can present. And there are the implications. Now, the, this is uh, so far vaccination is concerned. You have some, we had some problem initially because supply chain was got disrupted. So we talk about resilient supply chain, etc. Uh, but soon after uh, the political interventions, uh, we can see that supply of the important ingredients and parts and components for uh, production of uh, vaccines uh, has been resumed. And India uh, today uh, has started giving vaccines with several five to six uh, new uh, brands in, in that way. So in short, since supply has picked up, vaccination has picked up, 
over 500 million people single vaccinated and where i live in delhi here almost about 10 million people vaccinated with single dose and about a 5 million with a double dose i am fully vaccinated in that way so in the in and i can see there's a change in the economy indian economy has bounced back but coming with a low base bouncing with 100% 20% will be misleading the, the point i would like to present here that in south asia that india has given us a scenario uh, which uh, could be having or it can have some implications for the south asian region as well but there are uh, you know losses uh, you know which i say the loss in in terms of population in terms of economy in terms of other things these losses was required in the sense that we need to know what how resilient is our economy is all about so some kind of testings through this pandemic management has happened and i think some of the regional products that we india now present you know in terms of the software that india is is, is has introduced open source software called covin you know which is being used as, as a regional public goods uh, of course bangladesh has its own own um, surveillance uh, management in bangla nepal has its, its own language arrangement so also sri lanka so so the point here that you know when you talk about you know up coming up with a resilient system to look at in socio economic uh, aspects that one project which i present for the panel discussion and also the participants how do we connect this all you know surveillance arrangements that individually they have arranged but recall soon after the covid uh, uh, came in, in 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 2020 south asian leaders they met uh, virtually the first virtual meeting uh, in in the world which actually gave lot of inspiration to other forum like g20 and etc so so this is where south asia took a you know uh, lead in terms of giving a political direction but that later on it fizzled out or diluted to some extent so this is uh, one advantage that we, we, we received but this also you know there are drawbacks because we could not sustain uh, or in the you have a minute left yeah and just on coming and within a minute i will conclude uh, that uh, in in case of in india i mean so far is good uh, we have uh, india has presented with 100 about 150 billion dollar of infrastructure package in terms of stimulus and etc this Certainly, these are having some implications in the, in the, in the down bottom. Uh, that India has introduced some structural reforms, logistics sector, financial sector, labor market, those we can go and discuss. And to facilitate trade, India is the first country to allow kind of a free trade. I said a kind of in you know, vaccine. For example, in South Asia region, if Bangladesh company, Beximco, for example, or Sri Lanka, Nepal, or Pakistan, these companies they come out with their vaccine and if they comply with the local procedure and standards so so there would be a free flow of the vaccines for the betterment of so this is what the second recommendations i would like to make uh, to the the panel that perhaps uh, south asia can come out with an innovative idea how to facilitate this kind of a regional package regional trade in vaccine and the other you know, health related gears last point and i close is that that india coming up with its own surveillance system for COVID management, particularly for the poor and people at the bottom, which you came out with like, you know, the survey, the surveillance system, the testing, the drugs and pharmaceuticals, which is a huge repository resources. So that can be extended. So point number three, and I conclude that these protocol surveillance, all, all these kind of resources may be shared in the regions. Uh, in the South Asia regions and the beyond. Uh, this sharing of resources, best practices, case may not need much investment in that way. So itself, the think tanks, universities, they can also do. With that, I conclude. And uh, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to the panel. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Day. I think it's extremely useful points, and uh, I wish we could have more time to discuss elaborately on those points. But I'll come back to you in the, uh, yeah, after I check with uh, Trump. And uh, Trump, can we play now Worker's video? Let me start by thanking uh, the organizers and, uh, of course, Dr. Salim Rehan for bringing us all together 
at this very important uh, session. Uh, just want to quickly jump into the three very structured questions provided to us. And uh, in the wake of uh, pandemic, public sector service delivery in Pakistan, like uh, any other country, has come under severe pressure. Uh, a concern of more immediate nature is regarding the livelihoods of those associated with various economic activities. Uh, the lockdowns have resulted in a uh, initial uh, negative 0.5% real growth in uh, the previous fiscal year, putting both formal and informal segments of the economy at, at, at risk. And due to the delayed medical solutions and vaccination drive, the second and third wave of COVID-19 further exacerbated these challenges. Amid low economic growth, the resultant decline in collections from taxes, uh, there were of course concerns with regards to sustainability of uh, social protection offered by the government. While some tax relief was provided to the uh, SMEs uh, in the fiscal year 2020, it was felt that this relief uh, may need to be continued uh, in the coming months due to prolonged incidents of the pandemic. And to sustain uh, the provision of tax relief and subsidies, government's borrowing requirements uh, are bound to increase uh, as well. While the poverty rate had declined by 40% over the past two years pre-pandemic, uh, uh, however, we are now going to see a sharp reversal with up to 40% of Pakistanis living below uh, poverty line uh, in the wake of COVID. Uh, the situation of multidimensional poverty is also expected to suffer. The unemployment rate, which was around 5% according to 2019 data, uh, could worsen uh, due to the future lockdowns. Job losses currently stand at somewhere around 1.5 uh, million uh, workers. And there are additional implications which include increased food insecurities and additional 2.45 million people beyond the existing uh, 39 million now suffer food insecurity. Uh, with regards to poverty, there, are, there is a gender dimension as well, where the household, da da household data indicates that women-led households and rural uh, poor communities are most vulnerable with recurrent challenges, uh, including social and occupational mobility. With this background, the government uh, did come up with uh, three levels of uh, policy response. First, of course, at a social protection level where cash grants and food subsidies were provided. Uh, second, there was an emphasis on reduction cost of doing business where taxes uh, were, were rationalized, utility rates were rationalized, uh, subsidies uh, were allowed, production subsidies were allowed. And then there was a response from the central bank side where refinance facility was available in order to retain uh, the, 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 the labor force for periods of shutdown uh, and to delay any negative impact which could result in layoffs. Uh, a mixture of these three, social protection, cost of doing business and the central bank response have allowed a V-shaped recovery to take place. And this year we have seen a, uh, an almost 4% uh, growth uh, this year, partially, partly because of the low base effect as well, but the real GDP uh, has expanded by 4% at the back of negative 0.5% the previous year. Uh, the reasons for this V-shaped recovery are of course amnesty allowed in the construction sector, real estate, housing sectors, which are also expected to create jobs. Uh, the currency devaluation to some extent helped the export sector, which has uh, posted gains. Uh, due to attractive and digital measures for the diaspora, the remittances have seen an increase. Uh, however, there are widening inequalities which still remain a concern and many sectors in the manufacturing and services uh, have still not opened up after the pandemic hit. There is a relocation of both human and capital resources across sectors which could also take uh, some time. Uh, finally, uh, how will the COVID transform? Pakistan's economy, economies in the region. Uh, in my view, there will be workers who uh, may not be recalled into their past jobs, indicating a permanent change in the post-pandemic uh, production structures or consumer behavior. And in the services sectors, for example, strict social distancing measures have already instigated changes in demand 
for labor and relocation of resources in favor of automation of systems and processes. This aspect is closely related to future productivity of labor force as they will be, for example, students or uh, a pupil in vocational uh, training centers uh, who will drop out and may never come back to their education or, or skill or vocational training. And therefore, a supply and demand side effort has to be simultaneously mobilized to move people towards new career paradigms. This will include active and passive labor market programs that upskill and reskill uh, for jobs uh, in sectors which are expected to see growth in 2022 and beyond. Uh, Pakistan government has started a Kamyab Javan program uh, just to sort of focus on, on this aspect. At an individual level, there are significant costs involved in career shift amid pandemic. Pivoting to the future is not a luxury available for many in these times, particularly those in areas with low uh, internet penetration. It is therefore important that these sectors are clearly identified by the government bodies and uh, a plan is chalked out to divert resources towards individuals who are not in education and not on job at this point. Uh, finally, as of course we are starting in a panel being represented by regional speakers, regional cooperation for three things is, is a must going forward. Healthcare, addressing food insecurities and building back better, including bringing a renewed focus on removal of inequalities and respect for environment and natural resources in our part of the world. With this, I of course thank the organizers once again for allowing me the opportunity to express my views. Thank you. So we thank Walker uh, for his uh, uh, intervention and also sharing with us uh, his video, recorded video uh, uh, intervention. Uh, so we have around five minutes left. We'll use that time. Uh, so there's a question uh, on India, Prabhupada, the if you can actually quickly respond to that on this question, uh, especially uh, with respect to how being the largest producer, one of the largest producers of vaccines, you know, the spread of, uh, you know, virus in India. So if you can quickly respond to that and also very quickly uh, respond to Professor Kunalsen's question on the recovery prospect. I'll then come back to uh, Pushpa and then Ganga on, uh, you know, uh, on probably on the recovery part, you know, if you'd like to respond. Yeah. And there is a question uh, by Ishrat Sherman too on the deal with the data deficiency in the global south. So I think, you know, you, you now know that you probably, probably the, you have to answer on India as well. Yes, over to you. Right. Yeah, but quickly, you know, uh, to a response to uh, Salam al-Rabadi's questions, India has successfully, as I said in my presentation, you know, successfully uh, vaccinated half of this total population, so over 500 million people, officially the vaccinated. Now this has having a very strong effect on the region. So except the few states, India has 29 states and except for one particular southern state, there is and some states in the in our northeastern part, most of it, you know, the virus has been contained as the current variant. That's what I, I, I mean. So it is not that we haven't done much. So so I'm very positive, you know, and in and in that way to respond to his questions that it has done pretty well. But if you leave out the kind of an way we faced in a few months before, you know, earlier, from there today, it's a huge change that I have seen. And to respond to uh, Professor Kunal Sen's questions on, on South Asia, the, the thing is that with the existing variant that we have, you know, the Delta variant, you said rightly, uh, if India has been able to ma manage to vaccine it's half of its population and other neighboring countries in the region if they come out quickly uh, then only we can see you know this region will be able to come out of the current variant and uh, hopefully by again it is my purely a kind of a guess and not a statistical guess by the way it's purely my own guess that by end of turn of this year or early uh, next year things will be much better so so this is my response Dr. Rayan. Thank you. Thank you. Pushpa, you have to unmute here. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, I think a very important question by Professor Sen, but I think also a difficult one. Because I think we are living in very uncertain times. We don't know how the Delta variant is going to evolve uh, with the news that there is a new variant called Mu. 
uh, with initial evidence uh, showing that this could, you know, evade antibodies. Uh, we don't know how it's going to, uh, you know, the recovery is going to take place. But if you compare uh, last year with this year, uh, perhaps things have uh, looked better uh, for many of the economic sectors, uh, except a few. Uh, and uh, in Nepal particularly, there was a, a seroprevalence survey that the Ministry of Health uh, recently conducted, although there are questions on, on the findings, but that showed that there might have been some development of kind of herd immunity in the country. And perhaps if that is the case in Nepal, it might be similar in the case of India, Bangladesh as well. Now, if that is really the case, and if na the natural you know, immunity that people have acquired uh, because of these infections is going to work, uh, in terms of uh, producing those antibodies uh, and uh, uh, getting the economy uh, moving again, then perhaps uh, we can see a recovery soon. Uh, otherwise, perhaps we don't know until when we have to wait for the recovery. Because these are uncertain times, uh, I think uh, that this is a very difficult question to answer. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think, uh, yes, of course, it's a very difficult question. So I'm just checking whether uh, Dr. Ganga Tilakaratna, I can probably see she's not connected. So we have only one minute, so I will use that minute now to wrap up. Uh, but I must be thankful to all the panelists. Right? I think it was an excellent discussion. And uh, uh, I think some of the very important points really came up, especially towards the end, the question on the recovery, question on the management of the event, the health issues, and uh, Walker and some other panelists also mentioned on the education sector as well, especially with respect to two important social sector, education and health. We are seeing completely two different pictures. On the education, many of the, uh, you know, most of the educational institutions remain closed for most of these countries for long. And uh, government and uh, management, they are actually struggling, you know, how to reopen these schools or colleges or educational institutions. Uh, and also in the health sector, though the governments, they actually increased allocation, we have seen serious mismanagement in many of the countries. And also uh, the government's lack of capacity to even spend the money in the health sector. So I think all these issues uh, need to be kind of uh, taken into account when you talk about the recovery, because recovery is not only the economic recovery. It, we need to talk about the social recovery as well. And where we can see economic recovery can be a bit faster, social recovery can take much longer time because of various reasons, uh, where, which actually probably we try to discuss over the last 45 minutes or so. So with this, I'd like to thank again, even wider and especially Professor Kunal Sen, and all my distinguished panelists to you know have a very rich discussion over the last 45 minutes and i'd like to conclude this session and thanking you all thank you very thank much you. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you thank you very thank much you.